Right, thank you everybody for coming. Um, the weather's awful, there's a uh, train strike, tube strikes, um, but we actually have a few people in the room, so that's great, and uh, hopefully we've got some people online as well. So uh, welcome to our SIVSI HVAC group, um, AGM, um, and Celebration of People. So, um, there we go. Um, so these are just some of the details. Again, just our email, LinkedIn, websites, so you can find those, well, and most of our meetings will let you know when they come up. So the agenda for tonight, let's get on. So I'm going to give you a brief introduction to our route, our mission, our scope, our objectives. Um, we're going to introduce you to you our team members, summary of our events for the last year and events going forward. We've got a social media update, our contributions to publication, other business, and then we'll close out. Um, so if anybody's got any comment, uh, comments or questions, then feel free to throw them in at that point. And then after our AGM, we've got a celebration of buildings and people. We've got some fantastic speakers here. So that's great. So our mission, to support and encourage the efficient design, installation and operation of heating, ventilation and air conditioning. Sounds simple, doesn't it? So um, there's a lot of objectives that we set ourselves when we set up in uh, 2017. These are obviously on our website, so feel free to go and have a look um, in your own time. But in summary, we're, we're all about trying to increase awareness um, and knowledge of heating, ventilation and air conditioning, promoting critical thinking, looking at design and operation. We also want to help contribute towards publications and technical papers and hopefully we get speakers at events like this. So I'm going to say that I'm just going to continue to say thank you to our speakers as we go along. So that's great. So our scope really does cover a broad range of components and interfaces, and they all feed into the HVAC systems. And the plan is to create healthy, safe and sustainable buildings for all. So our team um, this year has actually changed a little bit. Um, we had um, two people within our voting members that actually um, have stepped back. Uh, Debbie, who is uh, fortunately staying within the group, but she's going to be a co-opted member. Um, and we're looking to introduce uh, Matt Dickinson and Priscilla per her Naomi, sorry, <laughs> she's in the room, so you'll have to forgive me. Um, and so the really exciting bit about this AGM is we get to do a vote. Um, so what I would like to do is um, we have to actually discuss this before the meeting. Um, but what I need is to have hands up to confirm that our group is happy that we have our new members. So. Those within the room that are voting members, and there are two of them, uh, please could you raise your hand if you are in agreement? And I don't know, the camera can't see you, but um, <laughs> I don't think. But yes, yeah, so we have an agreement. So welcome to the group, to the voting part of the group. And next year you'll be able to put your hands up. Um, it really, I, I would just like to say this opportunity actually to say thank you to all our team members because um, without them, I certainly couldn't do my job. And uh, so I just want to take this opportunity to thank everybody who is within the group. Um, another thing that I just want to comment on is that our chimneys uh, and flues uh, SIPSI group will be joining the HVAC group and we will be discussing moving forward if anybody within their um, committee group would like to join our group as well. So how have our numbers changed over the last year? Um, so um, I don't know if you're all aware, but we can have a maximum of 12 voting members. Um, and we obviously have a number of co-opted co members. And Matt is also our um, events coordinator, but now a voting member as well. So congratulations on that. Um, so from point of view of subscribers, we currently have 1,659 subscribers and they're split between 60 members and non-members. It's absolutely great that actually our numbers have increased over the last year. So um, that's thanks again to everybody and the hard work that everyone puts in. So thanks again for that. 
Um, and we're always, um, we always like to welcome new members into the team. So if anybody's interested in joining the group, um, please do reach out and uh, speak to us. So I'm going to pass over to Matt, who's going to give you um, a little bit of an insight into the events that we've had um, over the past year. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Matt Dickinson, I'm a mechanical engineer at Jaya 10 and events coordinator for the group. Um, so we've had a kind of my opinion, fantastic last year. We've had four major events and also a bonus extra webinar that we hosted um, uh, with uh, Invipsa and the Boom Services, like Boom Simulation Group, even. Um, we kicked off last year with uh, a event looking at the, at the then very fresh uh, crew document home, and then we followed that up with an event on body carbon, and then still pretty fresh, 265. Both of those were really successful. We ended up getting right into the journal for both of them. Um, this was then kind of concluded again last year with an event on FN, um, looking at kind of their role and how we achieve net zero and more healthier buildings, um, as well as what I mentioned that uh, you know, joint webinar with the BIPSA. Um, one thing that I'm personally really proud of with over the past year is kind of the variety of topics and the diversity of the speakers that we've had, um, whether that be, uh, you know, like uh, based on the profession, we've got clients involved, we've got manufacturers involved, we've got contracts involved, um, and that's something I'm really hoping we can keep pushing forward into the next year. Uh, speaking of strategy going forwards, we're having to have continuing going with four events each year. Um, we're having to keep up with all those varied topics and the varied um, speakers coming in as well. We've really enjoyed the hybrid format. This was our kind of idea of turning to in person events um, that we, where we first started coming back and doing this hybrid kind of sessions. Um, there's been some technical difficulties, but I think we're just about getting there now doing it hybridly. And I think it's really great that it allows us to kind of be a bit more inclusive and accommodating for people from across the country who can't make it here, but other external factors to why they can't join us in person. Um, one thing we are looking at and going forward is our kind of upcoming events. We've got a lesson known session that we're going to be running on the 14th of June, so the most of your diaries. Um, and we've also got a couple of ideas around kind of critical systems and also having a follow up uh, webinar with a bit of the lessons of a few months. Um, if you do have any suggestions for other topics, do let us know. Um, but hopefully that kind of covers everything event wise. Um, very quickly on, on the social media as well. Uh, so we kind of, I've been kind of reinvigorating our kind of LinkedIn presence. Uh, hopefully people have noticed a bit of a uh, facelift in terms of the kind of look and appearance of our posts and the frequency of our posts and because that we kind of doubled our follower account. So this is the kind of graph of our uh, new followers over the last year and you can kind of see exactly where we're holding these kind of landmark events that lots of people kind of turn up to, which is really great to see. Oh, yeah, thanks, Mike. You've done a great job with the, uh, the LinkedIn posts and so things about. Um, and all our all our members do actually contribute to the, to the LinkedIn page as well. So um, yeah, great work there. So um, we have contributed to a number of publications. Um, this is sort of just listing out some of them there. Um, we've got some great knowledge within the team. So. These contributions are fantastic. We're also trying to help with the sort of knowledge groups as well. So I think if we move forward, that's something that we're going to be looking at as well. And then just feeding into the Sibsi journals, which is another area that uh, we, we we enjoy writing up our events afterwards. So if people can't make it, they can they can get to see what we're talking about at these kind of events. Um, and then other business. Um, so you hopefully a lot of you are now aware that the um, website has got a fresh new look um, and we have our own page there. And on that, you can actually download the links to look at previous um, 
events and related guides. So feel free to go down there and have a look and see if you've missed any that you'd be interested in looking at. Um, Ashley Bateson has been uh, chairing on the panel for COP26, How Far Have We Come? Um, and I actually chaired at the CIFSI Build to Perform Knowledge Theatre on the future of heat. So that's back in November. And um, I was fortunate enough to be asked to uh, speak on a panel with the Young Engineers Network in London uh, last week. And that was a great event to see, you know, the upcoming generation and uh, what they're doing to, to engage um, the engineers of the future. Uh, one thing we just would like to point out is that there's an upcoming SIPSI technical symposium and that's on the 20th and 21st of April in Glasgow. Um, it's a really good way to meet with other with other um, SIPSI members, talk about sort of the broader um, scope of within the industry, sort of well-being, energy, lots going on there. So do have a look at that and a couple of our members are actually speaking at that as well. Um, so I suppose I would uh, ask if there's any other business. I might actually open it up to the room to see if there's, a, there's going to be deadly silence now, I'm sure. But <laughs> was there was there anything else um, within the within the room that anybody wanted to mention that I may have missed? No. OK, that's great. So I won't I won't hold us up. What I will do is um, I will move us on to the next part of our evening. And a lot of you hopefully are aware of um, Kevin's 125 Simpson Challenge, which one theme which is to inspire the next generation, two overarching goals, and that's for us to support um, to sort of rules of for us all to play forward the support we have received to the next generation. So that's our support moving forward. And then how we're going to learn and share how building services engineers are key to the transition to net zero and fighting climate change. And then obviously the five challenges which you see here, really to celebrate building services icons, inspire the next generation, boost development of early years engineers, share your building services stories and engage with your peers as well. So we've got some speakers lined up for you. Um, I'm going to, am I passing over to you now? No, I think I am. Okay. Um, and I, you might, I don't know if you want a little introduction or as each person comes on, I'm going to Okay, I'll do it as and, each person if that's Right. Today it's about um, some of the people and projects that have been shortlisted for the building performance awards. You often hear a name for a company or a project, and we thought it'd be really good if you heard a little bit more about the background of those jobs in a little bit more detail. And I hope you don't mind, but I'm going to um, introduce everybody individually, um, and I'm going to read a little bit of their CVs because I often see these people at events, and I forget how impressive their backgrounds are. And I think it's really good just to, to remember um, some of the details of the individuals. So if I could start with Bob. Um, Bob heads the London office of Premier Grizzly Beasley, is an architect and has developed considerable expertise in low carbon construction, particularly in the field of retrofit. He qualified as a passive engineer in 2011 and has presented a number of groundbreaking retrofit projects at the UK and international passive house conferences, as well as presenting master classes for the UK Passive Trust. This evening, Bob will be discussing a retrofit project he won a Rebrew Award for and was shortlisted for the Channel 4 Rebo House of the Year TV series. Thank you. Um, hopefully you can um, all hear me. Um, 
So I'm going to talk for about uh, 10, 15 minutes about this one-off um, retrofit project to the use house in West London. Yeah, brilliant. Um, so just before I talk about that, I'll um, show kind of a cross section of previous work. So mostly um, domestic work in our office, mostly private one off homeowners, um, some welty res too. Um, Um, so the grey numbers are the space heat demand for these houses when we before we started work. So a kilowatt hours per square meter. And the darker numbers are the space heat demand when we finished. So um, historically we've sort of been um, I suppose fabric first in our approach to the energy retrofit, but increasingly we're trying to uh, seek to combine fabric with building services to try and find the most optimal solution. So I'm going to talk today about this house. Um, so it's a classic London Muse house. Um, I'll say a little bit about the whole house plan, a little bit about uh, delivering it on site, some of the challenges learning that we've had. Um, speak a bit about commissioning and then um, also about some, some POE we've been doing for the last couple of years. And then I'll summarise a few of the kind of lessons that we've been we've learned some practice. Um, by the way, I'm conscious that I'm an architect in a world of engineering, so I'm sort of especially kind of pleased to be here and hopefully. Uh, what I say uh, will uh, sound sound reasonable, but um, give it uh, conscious that so not the expert on the way. Um, so this is the context of the project. So it's um, it's a new size, but it's end of terrace, so its form factor is sort of particularly unhelpful. Um, and the red bar chart shows what was the measured existing annual space heat demand. Um, so tens of thousands of kilowatt hours compared to what it would have been if we were we seeking to hit the ACB standard, which is more or less similar to the Betty standard. And then the passive house standard is the kind of a very small red bar on the right. Um, and the pie chart summarises kind of where the heat's leaking out. So solid wall property, um, obviously not through walls, those. Um, so on the left, this is our uh, um, a summary of the measured build dates before. So uh, over 40,000 kilowatt hours going into the heat demand. Um, a substantial amount of heat being lost in flue gases, enough to keep a, a smaller energy efficient home that have been just, just going out from flue. Um, decent chunking of water and Domestic electric on top, but uh, heating uh, as an uninsulated building, the dominant factor. And that probably corresponded with EP, EPC rating, although especially great factor EPC. Um, so that's a section through the house that summarizes some of the key features. Um, so going clockwise from the bottom left. Um, we've replastered all the internal walls with an insulating plaster. So it's a lime plaster with um, four particles in it, and it's also air rated, which improves it. Um, all windows are sliding sash replicas of the original ones uh, fitted with evaporated glass. So getting close to a um, new value of the whole window about what we do. 
so it's quite good. Um, the upper windows, which get a lot of solar exposure, are all fitted with um, external blinds to manage uh, heat gains and only fit in the summer. And then on the roof, um, the top middle, is where we've found a place to fit an air source heat pump. So this house had no external space around it at all. So there was only one place uh, we could go for. I'm glad to say we're able to get that for planning authority at the time, albeit with a lengthy and expensive noise report. So it's been that. Um, and then uh, down the side, we've got um, the NDHR system, so heat recovery ventilation. Um, we've got a specific space to dry clothes in the house, partly for sort of uh, visual reasons. So you know, most, most homes, even most of them, nice to do homes, often end up with you know, kind of one's underwear and stuff so on display in the living room. Um, so there's a specific place for that, covered, which is part of the ventilator by the NDHR. And uh, the client's keen to fit and deploy it throughout. So, so doing that uh, helps us some of the COP for the SOC for me. Um, so for those people who are passive house um, people like me can recognize these inputs, the heat demands, um, spreadsheets. And so we've got the existing or the before ones on the right hand side um, on the left and um, proposed on the right hand side. You can see overall massive drop and you can see um, some of those existing losses, you know, the wall was dominating and on the, the right you can see how much even the fairly modest amount of insulation we've applied and uh, how far that's impacted. And actually roof and floor didn't perform especially poorly before, so most of the gains are in wall, window, and also making the building airtight and using heat recovery. Um, I'm not here to sort of elaborate on kind of the architectural um, kind of aims, um, but there was there was like a whole sort of architectural story alongside. But um, fundamentally, that isn't intrinsic to the retrofit. Now, the retrofit could have happened without the architecture. They were the two parents, especially both. Um, this is a comparison with the wall insulation. So we've got a lot of people when when, when I explain the products and they know why we didn't sort of put you know any more inches of wall insulation, why we didn't use a high performing insulation. Um, one of the reasons for that was we were sort of quite careful to manage the moisture risk, avoid sort of interstitial condensation issues, moisture trapping. The client was also very keen not to lose square nutrients. So this part, this part of the world, especially sort of uh, sensitive to sort of losing square meters, so that means direct loss in sort of um, real estate value. Um, so we compared this insulating plaster against um, other types of breathable, like wood fiber, and also this sort of very unbreathable, like you know, the INR insulation. And um, although the the plaster approach gave us sort of a fairly modest G value in the end of about 0.5 compared to being pushed down to be less than 0.2. Um, the law of diminishing returns meant that actually we, we felt that just going for a more modest G value, losing almost no floor area, uh, managing the moisture risk, we felt that was kind of the right thing to do. And it still led us to this, you know, at least a 70% reduction. It's amazing. So as we see, not, not such a bad place to end up. So this was the bill that we worked with, which um, impacted uh, only by a few square meters, which we were able to sort of design back in just through the space value. Um, so on to site now. So so we stripped all the walls of plaster. Um, or indeed, in many cases, just dotted down plasterboard, which I think is contributing substantially to the previous heat loss. See it, build data. Um, and um, 
and the roof was remade with more insulation, made much more airtight. The previous sort of roof, although it was insulated, had lots of recessed down lighters, which caused massive sort of bypass. Um, notice the dormers with quite fat cheeks and roof to accommodate both insulation and also blind boxes. Um, and then walls were still a bit of Tom Dab left on, but in some places been tanked um, where there was a moisture issue from the neighbour and uh, sensors being built into the walls as, as we went. And then a bit later on in the phase, so, so the first fix being done, MBHR being installed, uh, going remarkably smoothly. Um, mainly because of black, well coordinated, well designed by specialists, and the floor heating going in throughout. Uh, also, some space cooling going in. So the client asked this, this is fairly latent project. Um, we managed to squeeze these FCUs into these ceiling boys. Uh, it's quite a, it's quite a squeeze, a lot of work in the structure actually to help us out here. Uh, and I'll talk to you more about these later on. So bedrooms generally have these. And I think we felt due to the location in central London, the urban heat on it, correct? And you know, indeed last summer used to be the case, that you know, um, Without some active cooling, um, parts of the UK are just going to be very difficult to manage the future. So it's just a trial of um, trying to do space cooling in domestic uh, circumstances as discreetly as we could. Uh, these are pictures of the uh, plastered wall insulation going on. So it's a sprayed on approach. Uh, it's quite messy. The subcontractor learned on the job how to do this. So the day before this line was taken, most of the plaster was on the floor actually. Um, but he got the mix right on, on this day, and things were going much better. Um, that went on about two inches thick, which was for two passes of a spray gun. You can see this a couple of weeks later, the plaster's drying out there, and we've got the staircase going in. And then um, up onto the roof, there's the SLT pump. Um, amongst um, other bits of kit, so shading devices and roof lights and so on. And then just below that has all seat pump is the um, hot water tank and buffer vessels and uh, still, I still can't quite believe how many valves even a domestic science um, system has, but um, that seems to be the case. Um, And then this is one, one shot only of the four on the left and on the right after. So this was kind of about architecture, about moving a uh, staircase to actually bring light to what was previously quite dark ground floor space. So improving daylight, also improving passive ventilation, that staircase to a little bit. Um, just go back to this one. So this is um, a picture of um, an architect um, doing an honest day's work. Um, trying to measure flow rates through very thin slot diffusers. And um, the domestic sector is just not set up really to de deliver this sort of stuff. So I couldn't find anybody to measure it. So, so me and uh, a very helpful consultant got the uh, monitor along um, checked, checked these flow rates. Glad, glad to say it was actually pretty good. So it was part of a, a sort of much extended commissioning process. Uh, and so, you know, low energy buildings need to be well commissioned because if, if you don't do it, they simply don't work very well. So, so we have sort of quite long spreadsheets now. And the idea is until every box goes green, you've not reached completion. I'll bring it to hand over. So this was the one sort of points. So um, this slide picks up the earlier one showing before measured energy data. After in the middle, which is energy going into the house from radiators and everything else. And on the far right hand side, that's actually final energy measured at the meter. So between the, the, those last two bar charts, you see the effect of the source heat pump. 
uh, the coefficient performance of that tree being 50 percent so quite good um, and that combines with the fabric you know, uh, two multiplying each other together means that the dominant energy consumption at the end is domestic electric spacing space heat and um, this is temperature over the year so the gray band is sort of the zone of comfort the yellow line is um, something outside and you can see all those rooms generally very steady state um, occasionally a couple of lifts once where the cooling wasn't switched on once where it was we had this spectacular heat wave um, this is a zoom in on the on the heat wave last summer so the yellow dotted lines of what was happening outside so quite big temperature swings getting up towards 40 but inside never going above 25 generally pretty close to 20. Um, RH backside all over the shop inside very stable even in bathrooms it shoots up uh, and channels are taken and tips back in quickly Bit about embodied carbon so so we looked at this in retrospect um and i was glad to see that actually we spent mostly embodied carbon on the retrofit stuff and not so much on the architecture which is how they think we should spend it um this is it projecting forward um 60 years so the red line was the building before just sort of the gas boiler continuing to sort of go crazy rack up huge amounts of carbon the green line starts off a little bit higher because there's a big carbon burp at the start, but it works in bodies and stuff. Um, but then um, very slow incline in terms of duration of carbon going forward. And, and the dotted green line is if if we end up with limiting carbonization as you can talk about again. So a few key learning points. So uh, in retrospect, we could have got the COP of the heat pump keeping still close to 400%. If I managed the employees design better, so I will stand out if I should have done that. Um, we should have been braver um, at, I should say, planning. We didn't really go for PV um, because we were certainly powering about everything else. Actually, that this particular particular borough it seems to be shifting um, their policy on that fast building mode. So. Um, the commissioning of the cooling system was much harder and much more protracted than we expected. So all the bits worked, but we, we had FCUs from one supplier, controls from another, and cools being produced by an air source heat pump uh, as a third component. And actually trying to make those three components work together, I found that was quite hard. Um, and I think in the domestic sector, there's there's no good delivering sort of a complete solution, though. and that's uh, that's really on for um, people like me in the clubs. Um, I wish I'd watched out a bit harder on the domestic electric because actually the amount of domestic electric being used is sort of more than necessary. Um, I think we need to be at least very large refrigerators and so on turned up the hundreds of how that back a bit. Um, number five, apparently insulation does work quite well. Um, and indeed, good air tightness has really helped with comfort. So, you know, we're down to sort of 1.3 ACH uh, pressurization, which is pretty good for a house like this. Um, for those of you who are interested in seeing a bit more about the architecture, um, have a look at Channel 4 last year's house of year. I think that's pretty still able to see. Um, that's pretty much it for me. Thank you very much for your point of view, listening, and um, soon we'll get a little bit of that campaign. Thanks, and she'll support it. So let me introduce so to you. She's um, a senior mechanical engineer at Intro Bar. She used to be a painter, and she'll be celebrating room two chitting world's first 
um, whole life net zero hotel, which won the Visa Net Zero Initiative Award in 2022. He's formerly the chair of SIPSI YEPG, and everything is to work fine in a minute. <laughs> Um, and is also an active member of SIBSI HVAC group and all the Thank you. So, welcome to this role, but first of all, uh, we recently the really branded in January from uh, our former name. <clears throat> so, we just moved into this fantastic PhD in the competitive over, which uh, has also some accreditations. We are a candidate of the of family and community. Uh, so uh, we really look forward to get to know the building better and the building get to know us. So that's why we're uh, talking today about uh, a living experience. Um, we're not going to focus on our building as we can find out about that by coming and visiting us. But we're going to uh, focus on another project we are particularly proud of, which is Room to Home 10. What is a home 10? It's a hybrid between uh, a residential comfort um, that the Airbnb can provide and the convenience of a fully staffed hotel. So effectively, every key is a mini apartment with a kitchen and a bedroom. So how does it look like? This is a typical room. Um, and we started the design in 2015 where at the time the mechanical strategy uh, was uh, following what the GLA was endorsing at the time, which was CHPs and just boilers and heat pumps for heating and cooling. But thankfully, uh, despite being uh, the trend at the time, we managed to shift the conversation towards uh, more sustainable uh, solutions and uh, escort the client towards a journey on how uh, can the hotel uh, energy performance be optimized and how can we actually achieve the goal of neutral on net carbon. So just to uh, clarify what all like carbon means, uh, it, we are looking at the carbon emissions of both uh, the construction stage and the operation stage. And we are trying to reduce, first of all, uh, both of them by energy efficient design, uh, rely on renewables for um, the positive energy that we need and offset the portions that we cannot uh, achieve otherwise, uh, essentially because it's not very hard to achieve <laughs> all that carbon zero otherwise. Uh, so we were lucky to find a client that was really receptive also because he, he came from a personal experience where uh, in a holiday, he witnessed firsthand the effects of climate change uh, in South Africa on wildlife and communities and people. So uh, they made uh, achieving whole life carbon uh, net zero the goal of their own group. We are talking about London group. So uh, going forward, all the new hotels are going to uh, strike with that goal. So how is it possible? How did we manage to achieve that? <clears throat> Starting with the basics, you will probably imagine that the uh, uh, fabric, um, the egg brightness again was uh, was one, uh, and then uh, the building rent states. We have PV panels that uh, provide about five percent of the annual energy demand. We have green roof and blue roof. Uh, that contributes to reduce the peak loads and uh, the client has uh, has um, uh, adopted a green electric family. But what makes the project special? Uh, so something that you don't see often in London, we have a ground source heat pump on this one, uh, where the loop in the ground is connected in parallel to two water to water units, one dedicated to the domestic hot water generation and one feeding the HVRS system. So the idea uh, is especially appealing in summertime when uh, with a building that is mainly cooling, cooling driven, uh, the cooling system will reject the heat in the ground and the ground will act as a buffer vessel, as a battery basically, 
and transfer the energy to the hot water generation. So, so the, the concept of the ambient loop uh, using the ground is there. You can see uh, a little bit from this picture <clears throat> that some of the ceiling in the rooms are actually exposed. So that will help uh, increasing the thermal mass uh, and again, uh, help, uh, I guess, the pig, pig nothing. Uh, and there are also smart controls in each room. Uh, uh, so basically, the room lighting circuits and the HVAC will only operate when the room is occupied, uh, being automatically switched off to avoid the um, energy wastage uh, if the room is not able to move anybody and is not occupied at that time. Uh, the majority of the energy consumption of the energy savings though comes from the hot water generation. So the first thing that we did was to lower the set temperatures. We actually went to 45 degrees uh, with the introduction of the chlorine dioxide. Obviously, this is really important that the client understands what that means in terms of maintenance. And they were on board with that. Uh, we have shown uh, what energy uh, savings they could do, they could achieve. So uh, that's why this was possible. So just to touch base uh, on what that could mean, uh, this is a graph that Introba um, created in 2019 for the City Journal. And it was related to another hotel, uh, always in central London. And uh, we can see in blue the theoretical hot water generation um, required, and in green what is actually measured on site. Uh, so if we look at the, the two columns uh, where we uh, are in the day, we can see that the peaks are much lower. There, there are a couple of peaks actually slightly higher uh, around midnight. So people. Uh, after going out, probably have a shower in the end. <laughs> um, but then uh, we can see that the overall uh, sum of uh, all the columns is actually half of the theoretical value. So based on this example and uh, uh, a few other examples uh, coming from previous projects, uh, we basically size the hot water as 50% of the theoretical value. And that basically um, brought us to 40% uh, energy reduction related to the hot water generation. So just to uh, summarize how we we'll run to this, uh, by design, the, the hotel operates with an energy consumption of circa 89% lower than the average UK hotel. Uh, there are two lab rooms in the hotel where there are all sorts of sensors that uh, validate uh, how the, uh, and investigate how the rooms uh, are occupied and used by the users. And this will enable uh, the optimization of the systems both in the specific project, but also of the future hotels that we uh, are going to design and uh, as we speak on uh, It is really important though that to achieve this target of low life uh, carbon net zero, uh, everybody needs to be on board, starting from the architects, of course, because the fabric is the most important thing, uh, and with the uh, good your values and lower tightness, uh, that certainly reduces the amount of the energy required. Uh, even the interior designer was on board. Uh, so all the furniture is manufactured from a natural, recycled or reclaimed material sourced within 16 kilometers. And to counteract the environmental impact, more than 4,000 trees are planted. The carpets are coming from fishing nets. So there was a, um, a very detailed um, uh, Design of the of the whole um, all aspects of the hotel. Contractors also need to be on board because uh, often when there is a new uh, 
a new strategy for our new buildings. They could be, be scared or they want to go as we always done. Um, but we need to have in mind the bigger picture of what's the trend, what's the new trend, what are the new challenges and we, we have to you know it becomes uh, finally also the guests need to be on board. Uh, so we have found out that the hotel is actually more booked compared to the uh, original estimates because people really love the idea of a hotel being the zero. So hopefully uh, when they go to the hotel, they will not abuse the systems with ceiling uh, temperatures. <laughs> Um, the hotel also produces uh, their own parks in the garden, their own honey in the green room, uh, and they have a zero waste point policy, uh, meaning that all waste is either recycled or turned into energy. So the message here is that the luxury hotels do not necessarily compromise on sustainability. It just looks a little bit different. Uh, so we were talking about the living experience, uh, both in uh, our building here in Toronto, uh, showing the picture, uh, and also in room two. The controls are really a key part, and uh, how people interact with controls, analyze the data, and learn from the data, learn to use the building correctly, and the building should be uh, able to adapt to use that people want is really key. Uh, one last thing to mention is that we, uh, we, only, we always need to find new goals. Uh, we cannot just simply use the same recipe for all projects, especially taking into account that technology is changing, uh, regulation is changing, climate change is going to bring more changes. So even the same project, uh, looking, being analyzed uh, seven years apart, could be improved further. So we could have looked at uh, modern methods of construction. We could have looked at different regions. We could have looked at uh, different types of structure that uh, we can avoid concrete and use more timber. Uh, so. The goal, the goal is always changing, so we need to stay curious. Next is Anne Phil Draper, who's Managing Director of 2183 Vice Chair of the HVAC Group. We'll be talking through 24 new questions for make this CBC building full. Just like I point out, Phil didn't actually write this. Um, where they were shortlisted for four different awards, including consultant of the year and also building performance engineer of the year um, for Phil himself. I'm hoping you can hear me. Oh. 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 Oh, how are we going to do this? <laughs> Wait, one second, Phil. Give that, a try. Give that a try. Can you hear me? Okay, the modern that was a bit of a giveaway there. Uh, I'm guessing I can't move the slides either. This is really going to be magical. Um, uh, hello, everyone. I've sorry, this is last minute. The idea of this uh, was to give you a bit of an overview based on the four various entries that 21 Engineering were lucky to be part of at the recent awards. If we can go to the next slide. Um, so a bit about who are 21 Engineering. I started the company back in 2017. Um, I've been hanging around the industry now for over 20 years. Someone pointed out to me actually it's close to 25 now. I don't look it. Thank you very much for saying that. I heard you shout out in the background. Um, been involved, very luckily involved uh, in metering designs and FM in buildings such as 22 Bishop's Gate and the Lennon building with Cheese Grater. Uh, we're currently supporting clients such as the UK's largest stadium, um, and the world's largest social media company. Um, 
the key means of what we try to do is the hands on approach. So I'm an electrician originally back many days ago. Um, luckily, I got involved actually in the manufacturing industry, had a stint in doing metering design installation, seven years with British Lands before I went onto my own. So I've got a very, very background in around building services, FM and making buildings work. Oh, next one. So uh, 2020 engineering, we actually went for our first set of awards this year. And luckily we got to the finalists uh, for consultancy up to 50. The key reason why we believe we got to the final was our different approach. We're told by a lot of our clients that we uh, that they struggle to find people that really understand how buildings work. And I think a lot of that does come down to the approach we take on, as I said, mentioned before, the hands on. We pride on having every one of our team members uh, get involved in how things work. We don't just have normal consultancy. We actually have electricians. We have a number of graduates. We have analysts, uh, FM designers, uh, all sorts of different people that try to get involved with making things work. As I mentioned to you before, my, my link with British Lands and Broadgate and States allows us to look at things from a different perspective as well. Having been on the client side, as it's put, um, I like to try and look at how we can link in elements such as TM44s, ESOS, um, uh, all those different uh, aspects of what FMs are supposed to do and make them more relevant to how they work. Having set up ISO 50001 for British Lands, of which I must promote CBC certification as the body that they use as a very good certification body. Um, we tried to make sure that the 50001 fully linked into the engineering processes that British Land adopted. And I now take that same methodology to other clients that we try to use, trying to actually get the whole point of a international standard to work. I pride myself on trying to spend time with all the employees that we take on um, to try and make sure that everyone is upskilled. We try and make sure that uh, we focus on trying to get people to fit in what they want to do, not necessarily what they, they, the business needs. Um, the reason for that, I believe if you're enjoying what you do, you'll give more back and actually then in a chance you'll, you'll learn. Uh, I pride myself on, on youth. We've had uh, four graduates come for our books over the last few years. Um, luckily, uh, three of them have left to go on for bigger and better things. Um, they still actually do work with us and for us at times throughout that point um, because they, they appreciate the different skill sets. But I'm very proud that they've actually gone on to work for some large organisations and uh, expanding the skills that they've learned with us. Um, so I don't find it actually as a disappointment that these people leave um, at some point. I know they always come back. And uh, our approach to net zero, um, it, it's a very hard aspect that everyone has to go from. And I think the, the detail we put in our submission and how we try to get involved in making that happen with our clients around the relationships and uh, what will come up in a minute is around consultancy and collaboration. Next one, please. So uh, IO controls uh, are a BMS maintenance provider. Uh, they actually entered the awards for which 22 engineering uh, were named as the, the building service engineer. The, the de details you can see on there is uh, support and energy savings at Broadgate. Um, Broadgate is a British land campus just outside Liverpool Street. Um, the, the focus around this, and it was interesting, there was no other BMS companies names that I could see as a main um, provider actually for any of the awards. Uh, especially around collaboration is how this takes about and British Land actually employ IO controls directly for their BMS support because they see the fundamental uh, key elements around controls being a critical process and technology to ensure that buildings um, are operating correctly. So the way it's approached with IO controls, British Land and, and ourselves is very true to the term here is around collaboration. Uh, as much as uh, ourselves, Twinal Engineering and, and IO Controls are uh, contractors to British Lands, the way we undertake and review projects, uh, the way we uh, focus around trying to get the best of the buildings is why we decided to, to take this approach for this award. And we feel that if it was replicated across more of the portfolios and buildings across the UK, uh, it would certainly drive down uh, the energy 
and improve performance, which is why the little strap line at the bottom, the collaborations create an ownership which drives performance. Next one, please. Uh, British Lands put uh, their own award in uh, and it went in for facilities management, focused on a building called Exchange House, again, just outside Liverpool Street. It's the one on stilts, uh, a 1980s building originally. Uh, 22 engineer were named as the building services engineer. Uh, the reason why we feel this was uh, a very strong contender was the approach that the FM team was, was driven to actually uh, identify and reduce the energy. Uh, for instance, uh, give you an idea of some numbers here. Um, I couldn't put one here because I couldn't get hold of them. I know the building is currently operating at least a quarter of a million pound less in the energy year and year at the moment from where they were five years ago. And with that, that's probably less than a quarter million pound of initiatives that have been taking place. A lot of stuff that's happened here is how they've linked in uh, life cycle replacements and always try to ensure that any replacements uh, was to the better of the building energy. Um, when they've done border replacements due to five, six years ago, um, they've made sure the fact that everything they could do at the time was done. And one of the points there around the continuous improvement, we actually reviewed it two years ago and realised there's more we can do through our links with manufacturers and actually undertook a further um, modification around hydraulic controls to the boilers that delivered another 10% saving, um, despite condensing boilers being in place. British Stand have got a very big reputation around uh, engaging with occupiers. A lot of that does come around from their metering systems. Um, but having the occupiers on, on board allowed some of the initiatives to go uh, in the service charge probably earlier than what they would do. Might not have even got through with some of the other clients that I've been involved with. Um, uh, but that's made such a big involvement in and improvement to the building operation. And next one. Uh, this is me. I'm going to glance over it. Uh, Obviously, there's, there's two far better candidates actually in the audience there that will talk. I'm not bitter at all that I didn't win. Um, but I believe the reason why actually I got to the final was um, my enthusiasm. If you ever hear me talk, generally it's either around one thing, metering, or the second of heat pumps. Um, my wife does get jealous that sometimes I talk more about heat pumps than I do anything else. Um, it's very true, um, the fact that we had to go one at home. Uh, and it's one of those things that I love talking about and I love trying to make work. Um, and, and I feel that's one of the key passions I come across. I love sharing information. I will not hold back if, if I can tell anyone something how to make it work. I always feel that that's the industry's advantage rather than my own and it will always come around the other way. Um, I try and look beyond the project for a, for a problem um, and try and actually simplify it. And I think that's one of the key things. And what I've tried to do here is on the next slide, please, if you can. So I click again, hopefully it should pop up. Um, and what really I felt got the judges quite interested when I started talking about this project here is how we've actually got to heat pump to work and a retrofitted like a four pipe variable temperature system onto an air handler. Um, uh, again, I, I, I had to stop myself from talking around this, but how we got this building to go with zero gas with no capital expenditure really uh, for the building was quite remarkable. And this project here of trying to use a cooling coil to generate, to put heat into an IHU was such a simple project when you look at it from the outside afterwards, but such a hard project to think of in the first place. And a conversation actually we had actually in the uh, group earlier, this hasn't doesn't operate with any buffer vessels, despite the encouragement from everyone else. And this whole winter, we have not used the gas in the IHUs one bit. So it's a hell of a gas saving. And again, this is a project that, that should be used and adopted far more. Um, and again, I hope my enthusiasm for heat pumps is uh, one of the key things I'm always happy to share. I think I've got one more slide. Um, this is just a little project. Uh, again, heat pumps, love them. Um, this is trying to show the benefits actually of the metering data that we've got. And this is like a bit of a before and after for a heat pump project. I was involved with British Lands in 2014. Um, the overall job cost £800,000 to do back in 2014. Um, seems like a lifetime ago now. But if you look at the numbers actually on to the left, based on sort of reasonable numbers, the project and the heat pump, which is a uh, heat pump in the chiller replacement, have actually paid for themselves categorically fully in the energy savings they've made since uh, since 2014. And again, these are one of the things that I'm always happy to walk people around and show and get involved with, because I think being engineer of the year, and, and it's great with two people in the audience as well, 
is around trying to share the information you've got rather than actually just uh, keeping it to yourself. And I think that's one of the things that the industry's got to start doing for far more of that now is is making the data and the winds more available to make sure we all achieve the that our energy at net zero we need to go from. I think that's it. Perfect. If I knew I could hear the claps, I'd really be bowing. Thanks, Phil. Right. Mary Ann is chair of the CFC HVAC group, director of AIM. And again, the shortlist is for the including performance award tenure of the year. Mary Ann collaborates across multidisciplined um, business sectors to create sustainable engineering solutions. And of course, you're going to go through now with some of those projects and cable people. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks. Um, yeah, so um, APOM actually entered quite a few um, categories, um, and I just wanted to touch on a couple of them um, as we as we go through this presentation. So um, the first one, the category four, was about collaboration, and we entered Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs National Office Relocation Program. And HMRC is basically undergoing a massive transformation. Um, and the key to this is changing people's working environments. So really changing how they work. So the HMRC new regional census is basically the first phase, phase of a wider um, government hub program, creating workspaces that will contribute to the vision for brilliant service, uh, civil service. Um, and it's all about trying to get digitally enabled, shared working spaces, and really enabling the civil servants to collaborate and work um, in sort of joined up thinking. So the programme included 13 regions, centres, and um, really the plan was to embrace collaborative, comfortable and inclusive spaces. The ambition was to go beyond the industry office standards looking at inclusivity, accessibility, and really gaining commitment from their major project developers, looking at health and safety and digital blueprint, and all of this creating a better working environment. So AECOM actually looked at um, undertaking building services design, um, consultant for CAT B fit out. Um, that we have we were looking at the interior designs, specialist um, engineering services, uh, and fully provide a coordinated design to BIM uh, level two. You can see some of the locations there and the services that were provided. So our application spoke heavily on how we collaborated with um, HMRC, um, their regional centres and the government property agency to develop and produce a set of standards which all government hubs could procure and design with to going forward. We also met with fit out contractor framework partners and this was really to sort of discuss best practices and put value around buildability and delivery, valuing them as an equal member um, so that we ensured cost, programme and quality and making sure that that was all delivered collectively within the team. So then uh, the second category, category A, was all about learning and development and we actually got three um, initiatives that got through to um, the shortlist. Um, and I'm just going to touch on the three of those. The first one is our net zero carbon training guide. Um, obviously with government policies and industry best practice, we really are driving our clients to try and meet those net zero targets. Um, and we really need to focus on finding innovative and engineered solutions. So to increase our understanding of decarbonisation, sustainability and ESG um, within the business in 2021, we looked at developing a series of age training and awareness modules. The training covered planning, service solutions, funding um, and delivery of net zero design methodologies. And it touched on embodied carbon and operational carbon across the whole building uh, life cycle. We rolled this training out globally um, and made it mandatory for everyone in the UK and I to actually complete the training. And it was so well received that we then started rolling it out to clients. So that was one of the uh, initiatives that we put forward. 
Um, the second one, um, I, I find this quite an interesting one actually. Um, it's the University of um, Salford Energy House 2, uh, which is an environmental testing facility for existing and future built environment developments. And so the facility basically provides an environmental testing chamber which can simulate weather conditions across 90% of the uh, global um, environmental locations effectively. So the actual build consisted of two test chambers, approximately 20 metres by 20 metres and 15 metres high. Um, obviously it has sort of access to a large modular um, construction moving in. So the ventilation system consisted of three air handling units feeding a common supply header that then fed some secondary, um, a series of secondary low level headers to make sure that we've got an even distribution of air around each chamber. We modelled the, um, the airflow in CFD analysis to confirm that the airflow velocity was as we were expecting. The airflow needed to be um, delivered to between minus 20 and 40 degrees with a 0.5 plus or minus accuracy and the control was 5% on the HR as well, so, so really quite um, tight limits there. And obviously the duct work had to be designed to minimise um, condensation and icing. The cooling was provided by a central ammonia refrigerant system, which is obviously normally used for larger industrial applications. Um, and the chamber, really, the plan is to allow um, future building products to be tested, obviously, before they go out to market. Um, and it can simulate daily and weekly climate profiles. Um, so it's really great. Um, I just think it's a great example of how we can make sure our products are are as we are designing them. Um, as you can see here, we can produce snow as well. And obviously one that we all need in this country is rain. Um, and within the first three months, they basically built, they built two houses within, um, uh, within the chambers for developers Barrett and um, Bellway. Um, and they've actually tested thermal, the thermal performance of electric vehicles in there as well. Um, and someone suggesting that it's actually taking more energy to heat up a car than it does our houses these days but um, at least we're getting ahead on the car industry in some form or another um so then um the last one um that i just wanted to touch on was the uh, build better now cop virtual pavilion um this was part of the uk green buildings council response to the challenge of net zero um carbon economy economy for COP26 and ACOM are commissioned to design, develop and actually host uh, this virtual exhibition. Um, it actually got a highly commended within the awards um, and I think if you if you've actually seen it's well uh, I've got a there's a QR code but if you've actually seen it it's it's quite amazing to look at and it's all about um, a virtual exhi exhibition, um, fully accessible online, showcasing um, some of the most inspiring uh, built environments around, from around the world. And there was a hundred partners that had to get involved um, in this. Um, so virtual um, visitors can basically explore 17 sustainable projects um, via this virtual treetop gallery. Um, the sounds and all sorts of things going on there and you can learn how to how we can be more regenerative and sustainable within our environment. Um, really immersive system um, and really gets us to look at the impact of our buildings and cities that we inhabit. So if you haven't taken a look already, um, that's the QR code that you to have a look at um, and it really does get us to look at how um, critical part we play in trying to combat climate change. And then um, just on the last one, I feel, I feel I should just touch on this as well. Um, so, and I'm, I'm actually not, seriously, I, I, it went to the right person. Um, so just the pro, the pro, it was a really interesting process of that uh, Steve's going to come up and tell you a bit about, um, you know, how his journey as well. But for me, uh, I had to get nominated in the first place, which was absolutely fantastic that my company felt that I was um, sort of in a position where I could possibly win, you know, the engineer of the year. Um, I asked beforehand 
and what how I could prepare for the interview. And Zibsy came back and said absolutely nothing, just turn up. And then the first question they asked is, oh, I want you to talk for 10 minutes about yourself, which normally wouldn't be a problem, but I like to prepare for these things. So um, it was it was quite it was it was quite an interesting sort of experience to have to just like just get straight in back into what I've been doing. So I touched on um, some of the projects that I've worked on. I mean, for me, it's all about training and development and what I've been doing within my business about inspiring that next generation, which I, I did probably play on quite a lot because obviously it's you know, the 125 challenge. Um, and then the final question that the judging panel asked me is, what would the award mean to me? And obviously I gave a fantastic response, uh, but obviously not good enough. <laughs> and, uh, but it really, it really is just about, regardless of the people's backgrounds, their gender, their age, it's about how we as an industry can really um, inspire the next generation. So I'm going to pass on to um, Steve's going to tell you all about how he actually won, I'm hoping. <laughs> and um, I think Dave's probably going to do an introduction for him first. Thank you. So during his 25 year career at Hub, Steve has been a mechanical services designer, a building performance consultant, an associate carbon and net zero consultant. His current role is to focus on driving transformational change required to achieve net zero carbon from portfolio strategy down to project delivery. He's recently beaten um, Marianne. Where to start? Um, so I would I would just like to say for a start, uh, there was a very strong shortness this year. I was I was genuinely being serious. I was I was kind of honoured to be along alongside Mary and a bit of a long shortness. I can't completely explain the fact that I've won. Um, I still don't quite know what happened. Um, I think uh, it's maybe partly because I'm I'm getting older and more opinionated, um, and I'm more willing to share my opinions maybe these days than I was a few years ago. Um, so they they asked me in the interview what you know what what would it mean to me what would I do with it, um, and I do find myself doing more um, seminars, talking more about our journey to next year over these days. Um, and publications. So I think I read one last year. There's another one for the World Building Council for Sustainable Development coming out, hopefully, so we get shortly. Um, and I think what this gives me is an opportunity to talk more and to, to try and help us as an industry kind of make it a transition a little bit on. Um, I think in, in that, um, I'm very grateful to Mary Ann, firstly, because she's still talking to me. <laughs> Very nice. And secondly, for giving me an opportunity to come and do some of that and talk a little bit about this. So, um, so I thought I'd talk this evening a little bit about my journey, but it's in a sense it's not just my journey; it's our journey, really. That I'm talking about. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that, and 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 then a little bit about where I think we're we're going next. Um, so this is my first project, first real project in the late nineties. Merrill Lynch headquarters, as it was, until they went bust and all the things. Um, and I, in 1998, I had a row with my boss about this building, um, and I probably in, in, I don't I don't really have rounds with people. That's not the way I work. So I probably only sort of probably call them out with maybe five or six people in my entire career. But and I don't know quite well my boss. But I fell out with him about um, condensing boilers because I was I was determined that this building was going to have condensing boilers, and we designed it for that. And in the end. The condensing boilers that were available at the time, I think, would do a six bar pressure and they were in the basement and needed 10 bars, but we couldn't make it work. And I, I was, you know, a year or two into my career, I was just furious about it. And I mentioned this because I think energy efficiency is, is something that is in our blood as engineers, engineers, see engineers. And I think all of us have kind of been wanting to kind of let that out. And actually, that's largely what's happened um, throughout my kind of 25 year career is that energy efficiency. Has become much more front and central. We talk much more to our clients about it. But interestingly, as I'll come to at the end, I think that the question we're being asked is changing suddenly. I think that's it's actually what we're being asked. And 
So this is this is the athletes village, which was kind of the last project I did as a proper mechanical engineer and the first project I did moving into kind of broader sustainability and net zero. Um, it was also interesting, one of the projects that started the debate about overheating in residential. Um, and we were at, we were charged, we were challenged by the design review panel at the time to look at overheating now and to look at overheating in kind of climate change scenarios going into the future, which a lot of a lot of research Arab was doing at the time. Um, and that was interesting, and it, it started in the profile, but it was one of the things that started the process that led to tier 59. Um, energy efficiency at the time in terms of the building was really just about SAP, but it was, it was a compliance exceedance basis. But interestingly, there was a net zero angle, although we didn't call it net zero, we called it carbon neutral at the time, um, for this project and for the, the, um, the development of the whole. So this is the King's Yard um, energy sense of the building. Um, and at the, at the time, it was all about gas CHP and then going beyond gas CHP, looking at biomass, biomass boilers, which there are some biomass CHP, which in case didn't go ahead due to the kind of strains that they wanted to get built at the time. Um, but I mean, it's interesting, you think, think you, you know, I think we had the right idea in principle at the time, but the solutions that were on the table are very different to the solutions that are on the table now. And I think we have come, we've come a long way in terms of how we understand and consider against it. Um, after that, a lot of my um, my career especially spent working with Crown State, which is where I was here. Um, so I managed an operation improvement program um, from 2012 through to about 2018, Crown State, looking at their central London assets mainly and looking at how they could be uh, more energy efficient and more sustainable in a broader sense. And I think if there was one thing I, I would um, insist on in our industry, we do try and do it as much as we can at Arab, is that everybody who has, has a design responsibility for building should go and spend a year or two, uh, or even a month or two, uh, working in FM, managing existing buildings. It is a very different world. And I think my, my understanding of the design process, and particularly the application of complexity, has changed completely based on seeing how these buildings are run, um, you know, what, what the budget will and we won't stretch to in operation, what kind of skills are available, um, on that whole process of how the buildings run. And, and I think if you don't really understand that, you're in danger of delivering over complex buildings that will, will never really get to, get to where we're going to get. That's, that's to be a good step. Um, look, one, one, one of the other things we did, um, we had quite a sort of broad sustainability based issue with the crowd state. Uh, in 2013, we wrote, wrote the first version of their development sustainability principle, which was essentially their development manual um, for their, their development pipeline, central London and regional. Um, and one of the, so this, this was three, I think, but we, were, we wrote version one in 2013. And one of the things that we were very keen on is that all the designers should be measured, calculate, and set a target for the operational performance of their buildings. And in 2013, that was a really difficult thing to get people to do. Um, there was, so this was just before the end of the report. Um, and we were engaging with the designers, trying to get them to understand this what we wanted to do. There was really no basis in the industry for doing those calculations. Um, and everybody was very worried about it. And Aaron to be there at the time, quite worried about it, worried about liability and worried about getting it wrong. Luckily, just as we were doing this, TM54 TM was published by any cost, and as it happened, any cost were one of the one of the three um, framework designers that we worked with at the ground state. So ACOM really had no way to go on this. Um, and from from that point, the ground state has insisted that all the buildings have design estimates. Um, and I think if you think about this timeline that we've been on since then, so that was really the, our first kind of toe in the water. Um, it was quite a lightweight methodology, and it had to be because it was from scratch and the idea that we're going to do any of these calculations was very new. Um, but it did a job, it started the debate, it got people measuring and engaging with the actual operational performance of their buildings and a whole series of things that were kind of previously sort of out of scope and compliance work and into scope. Um, the next really, the next significant thing was 2016 or 2015, I can't remember, but the, the start of the design for performance program led by the best of the partnership, which led on to things to name it. 2020. I was quite involved in that 2016 so I was a technical advisor and um, crowd state. Crowd state were involved as well, at least. 
So that was the start of that process. And I think as they started the engagement, um, there was a lot of kind of uh, sort of groundswell of enthusiasm from developers and from the industry as a whole for this this transformation to the idea that we really develop as much more performance. Um, doesn't didn't get so much press, but the, the 2018 version of React sort of uh, embraced that and essentially we've had a, a included um, precursor to Naples. Naples itself launched in 2020 and well trials and you know, projects were a few projects pilot but they were already essentially running Naples on project before it launched. But if you think about it, it launched in 2020, and now it starts 2023, and it's pretty much fairly soon into private commercial real estate in central London, and it's getting a lot of traction outside London too, and in that space of time, it is it is quite um, quite surprising how quickly it caught on. It just shows how much the market is kind of ready for that thing. Then we have another plan in 2021, the VC requirement, which is um, requires TN54, as you probably certainly all know, and also requires operational uh, reporting of energy data for five years post completion. And that was a really interesting um, move. I think it didn't set any targets, but it, what, it, what it does is drive transparency. And of course, the one plans guidelines in terms of the volume card as well. Um, and I, I'm a, a great fan of transparency as a driver for change. Um, so that's really interesting. And I think that's still started to bite. I don't think the first I don't think any projects have yet got into that operation phase to perform yet. Um, and then 2022, we have the next update to TM54, which is kind of sort of caught up with that process, you know, much more ambitious in terms of the top. And now, of course, we've got the UK net zero carbon building standard development, um, which we're involved in, actually, what's going to be an awful lot of people in that standard, which is very, that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it shows the enthusiasm. Yes, and hopefully that will solve a lot of the problems that we still have about the, the, the Little bit of fluffiness that definition of the national means for us. Oh, and a risk log, which you mentioned, you probably mentioned earlier. Yeah, that's it. Um, the BCO provisional updates to the, uh, to the 2019 guide specification, which has now come much more in line with where we're heading for in terms of consumer carbon, and lots of people again involved in that. Uh, we got involved by Derwent, who are quite, um, quite keen to make a change there. But actually, I think we were kind of pushing it there. I don't want to the, 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 the BCA tax thing is quite anyway. Um, so I think we, we're still kind of waiting for the final version of that, I think. But, um, so it is, you know, that's 10 years. That's a long way to come in 10 years when you consider that it takes 10 years to build. Um, and so we did, we did do the uh, one of the pilots for the design performance program, and ours was the only one that was done in operational building. The crown state, the crown state portfolio, um, not one designed by us, designed by WPP, um, and they have done their uh, TM54 analysis. So that building has been in it, and the building has been finished. That's where they got. And we picked it for a good reason, sort of the crown state, because we knew it was performing reasonably well, and um, and it was actually in the mix of target range, which was quite quite fortunate. If it hadn't been a crowd state, it might have been a little bit less happy for it to be published at all. Um, but the interesting thing is, you know, it is, this was, so this was very early on. I think this was done in 2013. Now, since then, we did the post documents a bit later on. Um, but the interesting thing is, look at the range from the kind of low to the high. It's a huge range over double. And um, very, very different to the kind of margins that we work to now, where you're sort of, you know, 10 to 15% will cover all your rough access value. So we, this was a great start. We had to start here and we had to work forward, but it, it just it just shows how far we how far we've come and how accurate we can um, So bring us up to date. I mean, some of the projects I'm working on now, all of which one of the things they have in common is they're all um, aiming at five stars or better, and that's pretty much the market benchmark. Yeah. Um, but in parallel, with that at the same time of work with all these developments. We put out our three steps from net zero, uh, which I was lead author for the last year, year a bit ago. So at the same time as kind of trying to push net zero on all these developments, we're writing documents trying to explain to people what we think net zero means uh, and trying to fill in some of the gaps in that definition. Um, this was uh, uh, an we wrote just over a year ago for Building Magazine, which was one of those looking at how much we'd learned. So that 
And this was so we left to one of the buildings on the previous slide that was in design sort of up to 2019 with the building in construction. And we looked at applying what we learned in the two years since that building design was completed. Um, and I think it was originally modeled about 5.4 star maybe when we showed how you know if we done some other things that we've kind of learned since and apply those lessons we get to the learn six stars. Um, and what we were really looking at here is what the cost premium is to get to net zero. Um, so we looked at operation and we looked at the body card as well. The number that we came up with well, it's a fairly number of numbers um, was a three percent cost premium. There was a paper published 12 months earlier that a linear also participated in not without the ability. Um, that came up with eight percent. So in a, in, a, in a year, we you know we and that, that wasn't nothing wrong with the previous paper. It was just a question of how quickly we're learning and how quickly we're able to apply those lessons. So that had come down to eight percent, and I think that that number is probably close to zero now because there are if you look at private commercial, there aren't many clients that don't want this. So it's all so it's you know, it's fascinating how quickly it is. Paper. And I think the interesting thing for me about the BCO paper is, is that it's moved dial in terms of what's technically possible to actually see what's in view. So our engineers are now talking about fresh air only cooling systems with maybe some some planetary units of prints and but um, so well being, you know, increased fresh air rates, unfloor supply, giving you enough cooling on the basis of these reduced demand parameters. We don't actually need factory units, so you so that and that's a that's a huge step change transformation. So that's that's kind of where we come. I think where we are now is is on this this kind of cusp of getting some real transparency in terms of the performance of our building. So we haven't yet seen a building transition from neighbours, for example, in design to neighbours in operation. Twenty one more buildings than that, that building would be the first. Um, so. We've still got a bit to learn in terms of the performance gap, I think, for neighbours. Um, and I, you know, we, we tend to think of the performance gap in terms of energy, but actually, you know, from a, an engineering point of view, um, there are other aspects of the performance gap that I think we're going to learn much more about in the next few years. And one of those is air quality, the extent to which the material specifications that we put in lead to genuinely good air quality. So I think, uh, I think this is still a problem. It's been in too hard box for too long. Really, we haven't done enough uh, operation performance evaluation. We still don't understand enough about how our buildings form. Although, you know, other people talking this evening kind of show that's changing, and it kind of has to change. As I've said, the GLA is forcing a change. Uh, the well standard is forcing a change where it's adopted, and the name of course is really um, But the last thing, on the last point on this, and I think the thing that that is possibly still in the two part of the box, is that from an energy point of view, in order to get these buildings to perform, you need market leading energy management. And there's a real tension between that and the conventional um, minimum service charge, the way that our buildings are the FM is procured, the way that our buildings are run. And I don't think that that's not a, a criticism of the people that run our buildings. That's that's a you know, financial fact of life about the resource that they have available to run those buildings. In the way that we expect. So, we are going to have to change and we are able to um, make such changes. So, I think so that's where we are. I think we've come a huge way. If you look at you know, what was going on when I started 25 years ago, um, operational energy is much more than the language that we're all talking about. And I think it's, it's been quite a natural journey for all of us in terms of this is where we probably wanted to be at the beginning of our career. So, now the opportunities there, the clients are interested in what we're doing. But this is starting to change now, and this is starting to get quite interesting. And this is what I'm talking about. This is what I'm interested in talking about. And in my interview for uh, engineering with you, I talked a lot about. And um, so the debate is starting to shift now from energy efficiency and low operational carbon to whole life carbon. And I should just say at the point that this point. So this is the other award that we won, uh, which I'm probably uh, used to remember to talk about. Whether it's starting to talk about remain friends with my friends. Um, and this was about embodied carbon, and this is this is a quote from the also citation. So investment in understanding embodied carbon, assessing design options with the lowest impact. And this is where we are. We are it's understanding. This is this is the base that we're in. Trying to understand embodied carbon in services, trying to work out how we measure it, how we measure it accurately, 
and then what we do with that information. This is, as I say, this is, I think, a challenge that faces us now, how we recalibrate ourselves in a whole wide of world. Um, so there are some things I think that, that we're starting to understand that are probably straight, quite straightforward. Um, things like triple glazing using raw carbon to manufacture, but it saves an operation. Not always. Um, and chill seeding as well. You know, the idea chill seeding means that the energy efficiency you get out of it is a bit less than the carbon produced. Um, so that you can kind of understand. It's kind of intuitive. But the thing that, that is, getting, is getting much more interesting in this area, and we're doing some research into this, and lots of people are too, is this issue of the time value of carbon. So if you consider, you know, we tend to think of a notional sort of 60 year life. It, is it right to put more carbon into the upfront manufacturing construction of the building to save carbon over the next 60 years when our climate challenge will really play out over the next 10 to 15? So that, that kind of time value, how much what how much value you put on a carbon carbon saving in 30 or 40 or 50 years' time, how much how certain you are about that saving, what its characteristics are, is a question that none of us really have the answer to. But we're going to have to start thinking about it because that's very much the balance that we're looking at with the option issues. Um, just as an example, so this is this is a piece of work we did with Imperial College about last summer, which we're about to take into the next phase, looking at the decarbonisation of their their entire campus, South Kent, which is not far the biggest. Um, and this this is this makes perfect sense logically. You would think um, you've got a historic campus largely gas fired CHP, so you take your kind of fabric approach, you apply that to all your buildings, you reduce the temperature at which they need heating, um, you take out the CHP, you put in conventional heat pumps that run at lower temperature, it all works perfectly, it's the operation that you get. But if you consider the embodied carbon, um, and you consider how that plays out to 2030, you consider the embodied carbon impact, um, alongside the operational carbon impact, by 2030, you haven't actually saved yourself any carbon at all, but in as much as you've taken out. And now that, that does start to change as you go further forward, but that depends on what value of carbon is over long term. So what, what, what we considered when we did this first little study to be an obvious answer isn't quite as obvious as you think. And I think this is where we're getting to. Um, and one of the one of the problems to date has been that a lot of corporations use science-based targets. Science-based targets are very focused on scope one and scope two emissions. So a lot of organizations have set themselves scope one and two emission targets, reduction targets, and their target for their scope three, which can include in, in the property sector, includes all those construction emissions, which is huge. And SBTI asks you to measure that, but it asks you to set any target against it, but it doesn't really give you much guidance as to what that target needs to be. Um, but that's starting to change. Um, SPTI is launching a building specific methodology in well, forecast of quarter three this year. So, um, one and a half degree uh, embodied emission decarbonisation pathways in the building sector. And um, so that will mean most of our large, most, a lot of our large clients who, who rely on science based targets to set their core trajectories will be much more focused on body carbon going forward than they have been. Looking backwards, which means that that whole life carbon balance will start to become much more important. So what this means is, um, they will be looking at a portfolio level for whole life carbon reduction. So each individual building, which is the you know within which we all operate, and um, decisions about you know, whether to retrofit, when to retrofit, how to retrofit, would all have to fit within that whole life carbon reduction. Which means some of the decisions that we take that we would consider right from an operational energy efficiency point of view are going to start to come under pressure. Things like putting external shading on buildings. Is that the right thing to do? That saves you energy for a lot of aluminium that goes into external shading. The debate about in high rise, whether you do floor by floor plants or uh, basement and roof it looks quite different when you look at it from a whole lot of carbon base. So, and this, I think, is the really interesting thing because it's not intuitive. Um, and when I was you know, back in 1998, when I was talking about um, condensing boilers and arguing with my boss, 
that was an intuitive problem. I was taking an intuitive solution to it. It didn't occur to me to think how much embodied carbon was in the condensing boiling, whether it made sense at that point or not. It probably did, and I still think it might but that's not the point. Um, so I think these are much harder decisions, and I don't think we can rely on our intuition to kind of guide us through. We're going to have to be much more evidence based, think in a very different way about how we get to balance. Right. And so I think the new rule, something like sometimes, Less and more, um, which is quite different to the way we've thought about any efficiency for most of the last technology. So, most quickly, all right. So, can I just say thank you very much to you for speaking this evening, particularly as we've had a lot of teams around. Great, appreciate that. Um, can I just make one observation, if you don't mind, that what comes across is um, how passionate you all are about changing the world we live in. And we should be celebrating that more because I think as an industry, we have more opportunities to change it than any other industry out there, which is an absolutely fantastic thing. And it would come from people like you lot talking about what you're doing, and thus celebrating that, and making the public understand and talk about what we actually do as living. And can I just say thank you as well. What you don't appreciate is you want to inspire the next generation to look at this and want to be part of it as well. So thank you very much for coming along.